Welcome to our revision lecture on IFRS 15. Now, IFRS 15 replaces I is 18 and I is 11 and the four pronouncements relating to revenue. IFRS 15 is extremely important as this should be implemented and effective as of 1 January 2018. Therefore, this is the buzzword in our industry. Now, IFRS 15 focus on a single principle-based model and they wanted to simplify our revenue recognition. They've indicated to us that we will use a five-step model and this five-step model will provide us with guidance on how to allocate and recognize our revenue. Our five-step model applies to all contracts with customers. Now, the purpose of this recording is to provide you with a revision on our five-step model, and we will focus mainly on our five-step model in terms of RFRS 15. Now, first we will work through the five steps briefly, and then we will move on to the details relating to each step. Now, our first step is that we will have to identify the contract with a customer. On your right hand side, you will identify that I have included a customer and an entity. Now, the first step, we will have to identify that there is a contract between these two. The next step is we need to identify our performance obligation. Now, what is a performance obligation? This is the promise by the entity to deliver, and we call this distinct goods or services. Important guys, I'm going to make use of GS, this is goods and services, and the D will be my distinct the D with a circle. Now, step two, we need to identify the performance obligation. Now, this will be the promise by the entity to deliver goods or services to the customer. Step three, we need to determine the transaction price. This will be the consideration paid by the customer to our entity. And step four, how are we going to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation? Now, this is an important one. How are we going to allocate the consideration paid to the value of our performance obligation? The standard indicates to us that we can use our standalone selling price. Now, what is our standalone selling price? Now, this is where you need to be able to identify that your standalone selling price can be linked to our rules of RFRS 13, our fair value standard. It indicates to us that this is the price when we sell the same goods or services separately to another customer. But it is important that one, there is observable inputs, two, that this should be a similar customer and three similar circumstances. Therefore, the example that if we sell those distinct goods or services to another customer, any other customer, that price that we would use is our standalone selling price. Step five. We may now recognize the revenue when or as the entity satisfies the performance obligation. How will the entity satisfy the performance obligation? When control is passed to our customer, and this is our keyword, control should be passed to our customer for the entity to be able to recognize revenue. Now, Guys, when we talk about control, it is important that you identify that we link this control to our future economic benefits. Therefore, who will receive the future economic benefits from that asset? 
when you include in a theory equation that you talk about control, you need to think about the future economic benefits of that asset. Now, let's look at the details relating to each of these steps. First, what is a contract? This is an agreement between two or more parties. Now, important, this can be oral or written. If it is a written contract, remember, it has to be signed. Now, the standard indicates to us in paragraph 9 that a contract entered into between two parties has to meet all of the following criteria. It has to be approved by both parties. Each party's rights in terms of our goods and services should be identified. Our payment terms should be identified. And the contract should have commercial substance. Now, what is the meaning of commercial substance? They indicate to us in practice that a contract will have commercial substance if there is changes made on that contract and that this will influence our future cash flows of the entity. Therefore, if that contract and changes relating to that contract influence our future cash flows, that contract has commercial substance. And then it should be probable that the customer pays the consideration and the entity transfers the distinct goods or services. Now let's move on to step two, identifying our performance obligation. We have indicated that the performance obligation is a promise to transfer either goods or services that are distinct or a series of goods or services that are distinct. What is distinct? What is the definition of distinct? There's two questions that you need to ask yourself. The first criteria indicates to us that the customer should benefit from the good or service on its own or together with other readily available resources. Now, if you think about this, if you purchase a vehicle, when you purchase your vehicle, do you get your wheels with that purchase? Well, I do hope so, guys. Now, a distinct product is your completed vehicle that you can use as is. A product that is not distinct can be a vehicle without wheels. Therefore, you will not be able to use your asset. Then our next question, the criteria indicates to us, and is the entity's promise to transfer the good or service separately identifiable from other promises in our contract? Now, what does this mean? Separately identifiable. If, for example, the contract indicates to us that the entity has to deliver product A plus product B before our client is able to use product A. Do you agree with me that this is not separately identifiable? The entity can not only provide them with product A to use, they have to provide them with B as well before they are able to use both of these products. Therefore, they are not distinct. Once you have asked these questions and your response is yes, this is a performance obligation that you can recognize. If your response is no, this is not a distinct good or service and you need to combine this with your other goods and services. Now, a performance obligation can either be explicit or implicit in terms of our standard. When we talk about explicit, we refer to our contract, our legal obligation that we have. And when we talk about implicit, we talk about our constructive obligation. Now, what is constructive obligation? This will be when there is an action by our entity that creates an expectation to our customer. We will look at this in detail in our IS37 lecture. Because what you need to know is that our performance obligation, our promise, 
can either be based on the terms and conditions of our contract or based on a constructive obligation, which is an action by our entity that created an expectation to our customer. Let's move on to step three. We need to look at what is our transaction price. And this is important. This is the amount that the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for goods or services. Now guys, I make use of this example and I know that this is info oversharing. But I don't know about you ladies, but I do not like to use fitting rooms. Therefore, regularly, I will buy clothing, fit it at home and return this. Now, if you think about the transaction price in that sales transaction, do you think that that entity expect to receive all of that consideration? Now, this is very important, your professional judgment that we need to apply. There's four important aspects that we will have to cover when we talk about our transaction price. The first is our variable consideration. Now, you will identify that this is on our next page. Therefore, please just park this. We will come back to this principle. The next is our financing component. The standard indicates to us that if there is a contract between our customer and our entity, and that contract entitles, now guys, either our customer or our entity to a significant benefit. Now, what is a significant benefit? This will be a material benefit. This will be a significant financing component. Therefore, you will have to know that you will have to calculate your present value of that transaction. Now, there is a relief in terms of paragraph 6.3. If the period between our transaction date and the date that our entity receives consideration is less than one year. You do not have to take into account the significant financing component. The third important aspect is our non-cash considerations. This will be when our customer pays for the goods in the form of non-cash considerations and we will then have to measure those goods or services at fair value. If our fair value is not available, we need to use our standalone selling price. Our fourth aspect, where there is consideration payable to the customer. Now, I have divided this into three important questions. The first question, what will this be? How will we deal with this? And when will we recognize consideration payable to our customer. Now, this will normally be coupons, vouchers, and so forth, all of these loyalty programs, etc. How do we deal with considerations payable to customers? If it is not in exchange for distinct goods or services, we will have to deduct the amount from our transaction price. Now, if it is in exchange for distinct goods or services. We need to identify first what is the value of our consideration being paid. If that value exceeds the fair value of the goods or services, that excess portion shall be treated as a deduction in our transaction price. Then we need to determine if we cannot calculate our fair value of our goods and services. The consideration will be a deduction in our transaction price. Then as always guys, there's the one in the middle. If the consideration payable to our customer is a variable amount, we will have to estimate our transaction price. If you look at this, what I'm trying to do is identify similar principles. Our deduction in our transaction price, our light blue. Now, when will we recognize the consideration payable? 
and the standard indicates to us at the later of either one when our entity recognized the revenue or two when our entity pay or promise to pay the amount to our customer.